Hey, Chris is back here with another episode of The Washing Up Presents The Dishwasher Chronicles. And it is episode number two of this particular run. Um, I have diff different guest hosts every week. Last week, of course, was the wonderful Elena Duggan. Today, we are joined by friend of the show and former gantry dweller, Alicia. How are we going? Really well. How are you doing, Sir Chris? I'm fantastic. Now, again, you have been on the gantry, but as I've said, not as a contestant. No, as an observer, it has been, uh, was uh, definitely, it's a lot more involved than you think. So. Yes, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a far more stressful job being on the gantry than um, anyone could really predict. So. Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a killer for your back too. So when they're leaning on the gantry, they genuinely need to lean because it can hurt your back and cause um, debilitating problems. Now, as I said, so we're, we're, it's, it's really good that we've actually got you on, especially after what ended up happening tonight. Um, there was a little bit of ice cream. And by really? A little bit of ice cream, I didn't notice. It was, yeah, it Did was, you see some ice cream? There was a couple of them. It's almost as much as Callum having a, uh, last year, um, Callum having a, um, a cooking school. A cooking um, school, yeah. I know, I know. It's like that level of, so... When they say dessert in MasterChef, apparently all they mean now is ice cream. That's literally all they mean. The challenge was Heston gives you an ingredient and you put it in an ice cream. That's exactly what the, the challenge was. That's what I heard them say. Um, exactly. Look, we'll come to we'll come to that. I'm going to start with the drinking game because um, I like to start with the drinking game and run through the card. Excellent. We got really close to a Grand Slam this week. Um, the Vespa, that's a given. Um, mm -hmm. Hibachis, that definitely happened earlier in the week. Oh, it certainly did. Hero happened more times than I thought this week as well. Like tonight, it was like there, and it's been subtle. Like they've been like, oh, because, because such and such is the hero, and they're like saying it fast and moving on, but they're still saying it. Mm. Liquid nitrogen. Well, it did make a little bit of an appearance earlier, but tonight, it, it came back with a vengeance. I put it on the game card because I thought Reynolds was during the week, but, you know, he's Sunday. So, but we still got it. Um, Melissa gives life advice. That's basically every episode. Um, I she, can, is, she is the true mum of MasterChef. Isn't she? And again, there are a couple of tweets this week which sort of had the same sort of theme, which is how did we all watch this show before Melissa Leong? Um, I don't it's know. so much more enjoyable. Her oh. eloquent words just give me life. It's fantastic. I can't believe Blank is setting this challenge. Yeah, we had that. We had lots of that. <laughs> oh, my God, it's Heston. I can't believe it's Heston. I can't believe it's Heston. The other one, by the way, that popped up this week along that tonight, a lot it popped up. Did you notice the trope of somebody going, two weeks ago I was sitting at home on the lounge making toast and now I'm here cooking for Heston Blumenthal? And then there was another one who went, three weeks ago I was doing this and now I'm cooking for... Like, like, surely you only loop one of those lines. You don't loop more than one. <sighs> repeat, repeat, repeat. That was the theme of tonight. Repeat, <laughs> wash, win, rinse, and repeat. Hey. Since we are called the Dishwasher Chronicles, I suppose it's fitting for tonight. It is very fitting for tonight. Soil, we did have a soil earlier this week, and I'm going yep. to fight for this. We had that as well. Now, the one I couldn't remember was Yuzu. Can't remember if we had Yuzu this week, and I don't know anyone who can because it's been a long week. It has been an extremely long week. I can't yeah, remember yeah. the beginning of it, to be honest. But I, I, I do remember we had Yuzu the first week. Yeah, we did have Yuzu. We had well, we, <laughs> the first night. We had, one, we had the, the, the dish by the, the horrible flight attendant, who shall remain nameless, who literally put Yuzu in everything and Melissa had to ask him to inv invite him to listen. Um, so, yeah, that was where all the Yuzu appeared in week one. And I think after that, you don't need any more Yuzu, really. We're done. Uh, it's been, um, it's gone, it's done. But this week is Superstar Week. And <laughs> yeah, you do need explosions. Do, do, do. <coughs> do. If, you could, if you could have picked anyone for Superstar Week, who would you put in it? Because... I've met the man. Yeah. I would probably have to say Marco Pierre White. Where's his kingfish? <laughs> Where's his kingfish? Where's his kingfish? Oh, I mean, that's lovely man. Such a lovely man. Just loves his food. 
Look, for a, man, so for a man who has such a reputation within world food, again, for Australian audiences, he's largely the guy who yelled about kingfish for half an hour. <laughs> um, so that's that's kind of where a lot of MasterChef fans obviously rest on him. I am I mean, I was happy because, again, I got my favourite. Mm-hmm. Who was got, your favourite? I got my Massimo. I got Massimo Batora. And I thought, by the way, that... and let's, So let's talk about the way they used them. So we had... Mm. So of this week, just to run through it for everyone, we have Nigella Lawson appearing on the first night. We have Yotta Botellini on the second night. We have Massimo Batura appearing, obviously, because Massimo Batura is, is wonderful and amazing and lovely and everything. Joyous. Joyous. Uh, we had Claire Smith, and then we also tonight obviously had Heston, which was amazing when they were all shocked it was Heston, like they don't get Heston into MasterChef almost every year. Um so like last year they, that was pandemic and that's why they didn't do it. Um, but of those, I thought their use of the celebrity was not great, except I thought Massimo was well done because what I liked about it was Massimo Batura is obviously regarded by many as one of, if not the premier chef in the world. Right. And as a result, is far too lofty for your crappy little TV show to stand in the corner for an hour and three quarters um, and pretend that he's interested in watching what they're cooking. Um, So instead, you film him and you get him to make something, which is what you want to see. Correct. So I thought Massimo was the good use. I don't Mm. know. Do you think they used anyone else particularly well? Not really. I think it was a bit strange. It was like some sci-fi movie where they beamed that person to that area, but they're confined to the area, so it's really odd. Um, and it's not like they could bring the said holographic person to the bench to check on what the the people were doing as they were doing it because that's when you really get to see how they respond to food and how elements are made. And you didn't get any of that interaction, which sucked. I was really hopeful again, and we talked about this in week one, I was really hopeful when they showed the promo that Nigella was a hologram because it looked like she was in the first promo. I'm like, oh, my God, a holographic Nigella. That's fantastic. (laughs) They matched the background really well in that first one. (laughs) Now, Now, who was the most awkward and why was it Claire Smith? Because they made her stand just like in the middle of nowhere in her kitchen in the restaurant. And she just awkwardly stood and like waved and then awkwardly stood and like clearly was like, can I go do like anything? And there was one point where they walked and she walked up the kitchen. (laughs) sort of walked away and came back can you see the eye flicker there was an eye flicker she was like looking at whoever was filming her on the other side with a flicker like am i done can i go yet the flicker was a loop (laughs) the flicker was a loop she was on loop i will put money on the fact that she was on loop and i i would i would bet with you yep um what we also (laughs) what we did also get though we got a couple of interesting things by having these celebrities beaming in in i thought um Nigella's interactions were actually quite good, although I thought that her, the use of Nigella was a bit shit. I yeah. thought Yotam was kind of caught because he wanted, and he was cooking, but it was it was almost like he was talking about the idea of I've got prep to do, so just film me and we'll, we'll make it part of the show. Yeah. But, again, he, when he was standing there, it was a bit awkward. The banter between the judges and the screen was not great. They really did try, though. They, they did. The, the judges tried. They did. I love the fact they tried for jokes between Heston and Jock with Heston pre-recorded and pretending he's live. <laughs> I like the idea that the costuming had to match, production and wardrobe had to match Jock to the line by Heston about being a lord of the manor. Yep. So, like, he recorded that one and they went, we need to make him look very much like a Lord of the Manor tonight. Don't, yep. don't go fancy. Well, he did look very Lord-esque. So, you know what? Well done to the costume department, guys. Um, you have a stellar a stellar job so far um, this season. Um, Mel's earrings are getting better by the day. Oh, um, awesome. Those shoes were insane. Hello, Dorothy. Thank you very much. I'll take those ones. 
they've been on and I think Mel has had another really good week. She's She's been very much on form. We will get to the people cooking in there in a minute because we've got a lot to say on some of these things. But I think just from, from a general standpoint of the week, I mean, I get the fact they can't bring a lot of, they can't bring the celebrity chefs in. I get that. Safety. Mm-hmm. They could have featured, I don't know, local big name chefs. And maybe giving them a bit of exposure, and especially like you know, in a as they're coming out of a lockdown in COVID, and maybe going, hey, go to these places. Yeah. Um, I'm going to assume that people like Ben Shwari, for example, are going to appear later in the season. Um, yeah, because all of the guests would have to be Australian because they're not going to be able to get people exactly. from overseas. So again, like I'd, I'd, I'd assume that Ben Shwari, ben Shwari, for example, he has to be later in the year. Otherwise, why don't you use him? He's in Melbourne. Um, exactly. Like, and you could have got some of them down from Sydney, and that would have been easy. You you could have got people in from everywhere, from Australia, and that yeah. would work. And it would have been better in person. I think that what they lose, because again, we had a couple of weird anomalies. Like we had a couple of them talking about, I can't believe I'm cooking for Heston. I hope Heston likes what I'm making. I'm like, Heston's not here. He's and not, not going to be able to taste your food. Sorry. Tasting it. He's not seeing it. He's not judging it. And the other one, and this is where I sort of, I called this out earlier in the in the run with Nigella when they were talking about, look at what the cake that Nigella made. And I'm like, no, look at the cake that one of your food producers made. Can we give them a little bit of credit going, this is a Nigella cake made by our wonderful food team? They are amazing, by the way. Their yep. food team is insane. Yep, I've got nothing but admiration for the MasterChef food team. And I, that's why I said I, I, I don't think anybody would have gone, that's a bit jarring if they'd gone Nigella's cake as made by our wonderful food team. Just it's worth giving them a little bit of a shout out and acknowledging the fact that we all know that Nigella Lawson didn't send a cake from the UK. Precisely. Especially not one covered, not one coated in an outside of meringue. Would have been uh, a soggy meringue, very sad meringue, depressed meringue by the time I got here. <laughs> meringue with a dent from the way it's been delivered. <laughs> Compressed over the like over- a lopsided cake, like dripping. Like the cake from like um Sleeping Beauty. It's held up by like the <laughs> I knew at some point there was gonna be a reference to some form. Oh, uh, of- we were waiting for it. You had to get that in there. Um so on night one, we started with the biscuit challenge. The biscuit challenge. I don't know. What do we think? What do we think of the biscuit challenge? I thought it was an interesting idea. I did love the fact that Brent had chewed a mint on the way in and therefore could taste absolutely nothing in a taste test. Well, I mean, it's no cube challenge, but I guess they had to bring it in similarly. And they chose biscuits instead. Um, but I would feel biscuits, if they're using a plain biscuit mixture, would be quite apparent, the flavouring. So, therefore, very easy to do and to get. Yeah. I mean, I thought, yeah, I thought that it was, it was it was an interesting challenge with the biscuits. And I love the fact that some people were just boldly confident and some people were just obnoxiously confident for no reason. Um, which is always always interesting with the with the with the weird flavors. And I love we had a showdown biscuit. A showdown. And, and I like the idea that they were gonna possibly have like 15 showdown biscuits in the back. I mean, like really stretching the flavors. And you've got like, you know, biscuit, biscuit number 12 is like bin juice because we're so desperate for flavor and we're out of ideas. So someone just goes out, gets a biscuit, tips a bit and soak it. That'll loop. There you go. Try that one. Why is this biscuit soggy? Why is this biscuit soggy? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just, just <laughs> um, I liked the Nigella challenge. Yeah. A, a lot of people didn't. Why? I think the reason I liked the Nigella challenge was that it's it was very Bake Off, which is mm. playing beautifully for me. Um, it was based on the idea of could you understand and visualize food from descriptions? Yeah. Could you understand what techniques the techniques were that were required without needing a step by step? I think it was a mind boggle for a lot of them to start with. 
Um, and you could see in the different approaches that they had, some of them took it really um, literally and they went straight for the techniques that they were familiar with. Others were really um, intent on writing down all the bits that they knew and then filling in the blanks, which I think showed the preparation helped them in the long run um, for, you know, getting something that's closer to Nigella's cake. I think that definitely helped. I think the other thing that really assisted them to, well, let's face it, this was a challenge made for Tom. And <laughs> completely made for Tom. And it was only made for Tom. And Tom just went, I know what I'm doing. This is easy. Bang, 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 done. The problem was that poor old Tom got a bit confident off the back of that. And that's where we get mm. to night two where he makes the mouthoir for no apparent reason at all. Um, I, I still to this day don't know why he made mouthoir. Anyway, um, before we get to there, we did on Sunday night you lose um, Yo-Yo. I was really crushed by that. I really liked Aww. it. Um, I thought the Yo-Yo... I thought the yo-yo was actually going quite well. Early in the challenge, she was thinking through step by step by step by step by step. But again, it's that if you have one of those steps fall apart, the whole cake falls apart. Yeah, for sure. And that was unfortunate. What we did, however, get on night one that was a bit of a... But look, I like Brent. I'm going to say it. I like Brent. But after night one, I put a second drinking game card out. Yeah, you shared that one with me, didn't you? Yes, I did. I shared it with everybody. So the drinking game card from night one onwards was Vespa, because, you know, the Vespa. Vespa. I'm a tradie. Yep. I'm a tradie. Mm-hmm. I'm a tradie. Uh-huh. I'm a boiler maker. Oh. I'm a tradie. You are. I'm just a tradie. I'm um. just a boiler maker. I'm a boiler maker. Now, what I missed out was the, what he said a couple of nights later. Is it who would have thought these fat fingers could make this? And when he also went, you know, who would have thought an ugly mug like this can do that? I'm kind of over it. In fact, I'm very over it. It yep. was endearing very early on. And I don't think this is Brent trying to necessarily do that. It, it might be someone in production saying to him, talk up about your trades, talk about that. So let's talk about your background. But the other where, area where it could just be is he gets a bit nervous and gets a bit self-depreciating where he is. And I think that's something that someone in production needs to stop him and go, let's not. You don't need to do that anymore. Or maybe in the editing, don't put as many of them in there. Yeah. I think it might be an editing thing, to be honest, because if it is a self-depreciating thing, I mean, you don't need to include it all. And, you know, I think we're all clear on the fact that he's, just a boiler maker. Just a boiler maker. And again, like this this just thing. And we, we we talked about it last week. We talked about it last week with Elena. And we mm. were talking about the idea of the just a boiler maker is, is a load of it's a load of shit. Like it's Absolutely. just anything, like vital work. So speaking of vital work, Yotam gave us the first shot for a relay, which is great because we finally get the white chocolate velouté memes. And we've been waiting. Look, I've had to wait a whole week to get a picture of John out. Um, it's too far, too long to wait in MasterChef to get a photo of John sitting there ready to make his white chocolate velouté. Um, I was talking to, talking to a friend the other day who was explaining to somebody who's never watched MasterChef before um, what was going on with white chocolate velouté. And I said, how'd you go with that? And they went, no, nah, can't really explain it. It's really... Nah. It's impossible to explain to someone who's never watched MasterChef why when you say the word white chocolate velouté, people lose it. Look, I have family who have watched, my friends who've watched. They may have potentially even watched that episode. But unfortunately, I just can't explain to them what that was or what it is and why it was such a big moment in MasterChef history, I'm afraid. The fact that it lives... And, like, it's not going away. Like, you think by now the judges have changed. The show style has changed. Wide Volute shall reign supreme. Look, and again, last year the, the, some of the contestants in Back to Win actually went out of their way in, in their residences to make something bordering on white chocolate Volute just to prove it can be done. 
I just think whenever they finally get to the last episode of MasterChef, if there's not a challenge to make a real white chocolate velouté, the producers are not trying. I agree, 100%. Like, I want there to be a challenge one week where it's make something impossible and you give everyone a list of, like, five things that people think are impossible mm-hmm. and one of them has to be white chocolate velouté. Agreed, because. 100%. I think it could be, I think we could get gold. Now, I did comment the other night as well. We, we hadn't seen a lot of Sabina from Tasmania. I've, I mentioned her last week on the show and I went, haven't really seen her. I think she could be a bit of a dark horse. This could be interesting. And then we finally heard from her and she asked Yotam what he would make if he was about to die. A <laughs> little bit morose, hey? Good duck <laughs> fast. Like, Yotam, you can ask Yotam Otaligi anything you would like. You're about to die. What are you eating? She could have said on a desert island, what you could eat one more thing before you went to the desert island. Didn't yeah. have to be death. No, you, you, you're, going, you're going to not eat for like a week as part of something. You know, what, what, what are you eating as your last decadent meal before you go somewhere? That would have been great. Um, that would have been pen- that would have been fantastic. That would have been perfect. <laughs> no. Well, the judges went. <gasps> <laughs> and we had some flashback moments as well. Um, so the flashback moment for me was Aaron as a team captain. Now, why this was a flashback was all we got in the edit because Aaron was like running in circles the whole time. Was Aaron, 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 <laughs> Aaron. Aaron, and all I can hear is Aram, Aram, Aram from the infamous, like, cook through the wall challenge. Um, yep. And, like, that's haunting. Um, I, I have... That was a tough challenge. I have met, I have had lunch with Aram before, and he is lovely. And I hope that the poor man did not have to relive that moment. We're sitting at home going, I might go back and watch some MasterChef. I can't wait to see what's... Aaron, Aaron. He's like, oh, no, it's happening again. <laughs> They're calling my name and I'm not even there. Rocking, rocking back and forth on the lounge in the fetal position going, it's over. I thought it was over. I thought it was over. Leave but, me alone. I don't want to go behind a wall again. I don't want to cook behind the pans. You can't make me. <laughs> um, it was the, the, the team challenge seemed, again, that team just didn't seem to understand what they were doing. Um. You had no real communication in that. And that's the point of the team challenges. Can you communicate effectively with the people around you? And it was the three in and then the three subbed in afterwards with the one person as the captain. Right. Um, and surely the, the key needs to be whoever that captain is, is very good at communication. And they feel it's lead up. So literally it rides on them that stuff gets done. So... You've, got to, you've also got to be prepared to edit. Like you've got to be prepared to edit food and like, Someone turns up and goes, oh, but I might do this. And you've got to be prepared to look at the dish, look at the clock and go, you can't do that, do this. Right. Right. We're out of time for this. Don't worry about that. I don't think that flavor is going to go with that. Don't do that, do this. And I just thought that that was lacking a little bit, especially in Aaron's leadership. Um, As like when Tom came out and they were making the dessert, I think it was the caramel, was it the praline or one of those things? They went, Mm. he went, is that ready? Oh, it was the creme. Then was that ready? And he went, and went, oh, no, that hasn't been made yet. And, like, Tom had this look on his face like, you could have told me that, like, 10 minutes ago when I was doing something else. Mm. So, like, that, that challenge was a bit all over the place, but we did get to see a little bit more of Tom making nougatine, which is, again, a very bake-off thing. Mm. There's been a lot of bake-off elements already. Tom, Tom should very much be on Bake Off and not MasterChef. Yeah, I'd agree. And, like, I think he's he's made the Bake Off um, completely. Uh, the nougatine, as I said, I've, we've mentioned this before, um, when we were at one of the Bake Off grand finals, we got to eat some nougatine from one of the bakes um, in the grand final. Um, might have been stolen by a past winner who ran it over to us. But it was really, that nougatine was really nice. And I wasn't a massive fan of nougatine up until that day. And then after that, big fan of nougatine. Mm, um, converted. And we got a couple of great quotes. Um, the first quote we got was, this dainty little box that looks like it could cause no harm 
is this savage little thing you don't want to mess with, which if I don't give you any context, and I'm not going to, feels like it could be a couple of people's life mottos. <laughs> it just, it just feels, it feels more like a life motto for a lot of people than like a description of a dessert, which had a little bit of like kick to it. <laughs> I would be hesitant if someone described a dish to me like that. To place that said dish in my mouth. <laughs> you, the word dinky doesn't come across too well, I'm afraid. The dainty little box that looks like it could cause no harm is the savage little thing you don't want to mess with. It it actually sounds like a, a blurb on the back of like an 1890s book set in Victorian in, in like Victorian England times. Um, this dainty little box that looks like it could cause no harm is the savage little thing you don't want to mess with. Lady Penelope stars in. It just sounds very much like that. It's a, it's it sounds like something that's it's like Bridget and Susan. It's like a cup. It's a cup of tea, but it's actually absinthe. <laughs> Bridget and season two. Um, exactly. We'll talk about that another time. Yeah. The other one that's was. Not the podcast. <laughs> it was the same for the Bridget and Pod. Um, Great. The other one was. I'm also over the MasterChef trope of referring to somebody as the insert whatever it is here king or the insert whatever it is here queen. Um, yep. I just, I struggle with that a lot, especially when it's like their first or second cook. And especially when it's just like almost racial profiling and like Tommy this week had that where they called him the dumpling king. And what I loved was the way that Tommy just turned around and went, no. So Tommy turned around and went, they went, the Dumpling King. Yeah, is this the Dumpling King? And Tommy goes, no, I buy my dumplings up the road. Like, I don't make them. Who <laughs> makes them? He goes, Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Like, and he's right. Like, I cook a lot. Do I cook? Do I make dumplings? No, I buy them. They arrive. They turn up. Someone else has made them. They come with a really nice chilli sauce or a chilli oil for that matter. Some form of chilli. Anyway. The point is, you don't make them. You order them and you get them delivered or you go and pick them up. But you don't sit there and like meticulously wrap them for hours if you're hungry. You get food now, not later. And if you're doing it for an occasion or for a, you know, special event, then fair call. You make it from scratch because you want to make it with love, but you don't do it when you're hungry. I agree, 100%. And you know what? They they start on giving people titles way too quickly. Yes. Because you know what? We haven't seen even half of what they can do yet. They might be better at something else. So why are we naming them king and queen of something? They've made one good ice cream. Suddenly they're the ice cream queen. Well, that was like, well, that, was like um, that was like Pete. Like, or as I refer to him, clean cut, and that's what I reckon. And and clean cut, and that's what I reckon, which is much better than Pete. Yeah. Um, the other day, he made one sauce. And Jock went, oh, are you okay. the sauce? Are you the, are you the sorting king? I was like, no, he's really not. Like, he made a single sauce. He what made is, one. What one is, good sauce. Yeah, what is wrong with you? It was like they, they did that with Aram in his season where they called him the Flavor King and it was after like one cook and he's like, what? What what? <laughs> what does that mean? Can you please explain my title? I don't understand my roles and responsibilities here. I think the last time we talked about that on the podcast, I did sing I Am the Pirate King but to I Am the Flavor King and no, I'm not doing it again. But <laughs> um, there was one better line. I thought that that line about the box was going to be the line of the series and then... Melissa Leong has to use her way with words in the most delicate of manners. Baby carrots are the basic bitch of the bistro world. It has everything. It has vivid imagery. It has the alliteration of baby carrots are the basic bitch of the bistro world. It's just superb as a sentence. The words that come out of that woman's mouth are true gold. And if anyone wants to make a squazillion dollars on her words, write a book of words by Melissa and you'll be a hit. The words of wisdom of Melissa Leong. Are you, you exactly. 
It's you so, could probably just publish the ones from MasterChef, not alone the other ones that I'm sure she's given or has has yet to give. Also, congratulations to Channel 10 for their massive promo stuff up where on um, Monday night they scared the crap out of it. Was it Monday? It was, it was, Monday it was Tuesday night. Yeah, it was Monday night. It was after Yotam. Mm. When they went, and everybody stay tuned for Sunday night elimination with Massimo Batura. And everyone went, what, it's not on? Like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. What, 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 what? <laughs> and I'm like checking up and checking TV, guys. Like, no, it's definitely on tomorrow night. We're not stopping at Monday and going to Sunday. That's not a thing. Just um, a couple of episodes. Look, I'm going to give Channel 10 some credit. Last year, if you remember, they just kept giving away who was going home. So at least this year they didn't give that away. They just skipped three nights. You know, getting better, getting better. Well, eliminations on Sunday, whatever, you know. <laughs> getting, getting better, getting better. Um, but look, I'm delaying all my talk about um, Massimo Batura. Um, that man, I adore that man. Every time I get the chance to tell people to go and watch the Chef's Table episode with Massimo Batura, Go and watch the Chef's Table episode. I, I started a whole secondary podcast just to talk about that episode. Like, it is incredible. Food Nerd Vanity Project, which is now RIP, but Food Nerd Vanity Project began purely because I wanted to talk to somebody about Massimo Batura. That is the whole reason I started a podcast on that one. Um, it's amazing. His, his love of food, his, you know what, his joy in the way he is excited like a child at Christmas every time he talks about something that tastes good and goes, it doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be this. Stop, you know, getting in your head about it and use the stuff that real people use at home and make it taste amazing. He's like, it's not difficult. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, and look, you know, you know, obviously, just as well as I do, not better than I do, there are celebrity chefs out there who hate food and hate the food industry. We're not going to name them. Correct. But there are lots of them that hate food. Mm -hmm. Massimo Batura loves food and loves the food industry and loves what he does and loves the creativity and loves the fact that he can do it with meaning. Like he absolutely adores the fact that he can get out there and promote the idea of sustainability and promote the idea of zero waste. But what chef apart from him like there might be a few others that have teamed up with like mm. you know big grocery giants yeah. to help promote you know fruit for kids and things like that but there's such a purpose to his food it's not just about making great tasting food it's about not even nourishing you as a person it's about giving back in whatever way you can to people who don't have the luxury of having as incredible produce, of having as incredible fresh food that we have access to as people, particularly in this country, we're so lucky. We have so many great, you know, farms and vineyards and like, you know, places like the Margaret River and, you know, I could go on, but mm. we're so blessed and so many people out there aren't. And the fact that he's got a passion to help those people is incredible. Well, it's the fact that, like, things like, you know, his his five ages of Parmigiano-Reggiano, which is completely created because the cheese, in, there was a massive earthquake. He need, they needed to get rid of the stock before it all went bad. They were going to lose an entire year's worth of cheese production, mm. which would have cost them a fortune. And they just went, he went, I'll just invent a bunch of dishes using it and we'll get the cheese off the shelves. And they used all of it. And he bought the stock and they used all the stock and he made so many different dishes with it. And, like, it's just incredible. And of course, I, the, the two things I really adore in that chef's, and again, go watch the chef's table special if you haven't. I really can't stress this enough. Oops, I dropped the lemon tart, which is a classic idea of, oh God, someone actually smashed the lemon tart up. What are we going to do? We've only got one other left. Good, smash it. Let's just make it all look like it's a mistake. Spray curd everywhere. And there we go. It's an avant-garde dessert. And, and the other one was a lot of people talk about when you go to a restaurant and you only get like, small servings of things and he, he talks about in that episode about the tortellini and talks about the fact that there's only six and someone said to him about why do you only have six of those is about this avant-garde experience where it's like small food for and he went no 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 it's i want you to savor it but this is not food that i'm making for you to just sort of wolf down mm. you to savor it and if you've only got six you're savoring 
everything. You're taking in the flavor of the broth. You're taking in the pasta. You're taking in the filling. It's six of them. It's not designed to be a filling dish. It's designed to make you experience the flavor and pause. Rather it's a than, thoughtful dish. Yeah, rather than, and I prefer that sort of thoughtfulness to Heston Blumenthal deciding to turn the lights off, spray you in the face with some sort of lavender spray and go, there you go, eat charcoal. Um, like that's a different thing for me. And I know you like Hess. We'll talk about him in a minute. It's all good. But this is my Massimo moment and I love Massimo Batura. And I will Wait, happily continue away. <laughs> I will happily, you can see the look on my face while I talk Massimo. And like, I love him. I love the man. Um, what I didn't love in this episode mm. links into, I was talking to somebody, I'm not going to name them. It's not a contestant, by the way, but it's someone who was connected to a contestant. And they put forward that in their mind, there is a problem with this series. That there are a lot of people on this show that seem to have learned how to speak fluent MasterChef, mm. but haven't got the skills to actually cook master chef and there's a bit of a disconnect going on there and i've noticed it a little bit and there's a couple of things that i've noticed the first one i noticed was basically where aaron lifted i said lifted because he went i was inspired by um jock's um macaroni and cheese and then went on to replicate exactly what jock made last year as macaroni and cheese Change the name slightly, check something else on it and called it his version of it. Yes, which was, it was basically the same dish. Then we had um, the other night, Dan, then in the second part of this challenge, mm. saw Massimo once make these, those noodles mm -hmm. and went, I was really inspired by the idea of that. So I'm going to make these noodles. And I was like, no, you literally, mm. I tweeted out at him and went, this is, your version of I'm sitting at home on the lounge watching TV. I see someone make something. I go, I can make that, except you were in a competition um, and they were a judge. Um, right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of lazy food going on. And a lot of copycats. Mm, I thought there was a bit tonight. I thought that, look, we'll sort of jump ahead a little bit because we're not having to go through flow. I thought the problem with tonight's challenge with, with Heston was it is the laziest I've ever seen MasterChef in that everybody competing made an ice cream. It wasn't the, here's your flavor, make an ice cream out of it where, you know, you've got a really strange flavor like anchovies, you know, several seasons back, we got something very difficult to make an ice cream with. And that was half the challenge of how to incorporate that flavor into it. Like the beach hut challenge they had way back when, but yeah, this was a challenge that was supposed to go outside the box. This was when, you know, when in his season, Ranald was like, what can I do? What is the craziest thing I can think of to do with this flavor? Like, give me every scientific thing under the sun that I've got access to. What other machines have I used, you know, that I haven't used yet that I can suddenly think of something as, you know, blown sugar and an apple or whatever it might be and we saw we saw crumbs we saw creams we saw ice cream and that was about it until the appearance of the nitrogen which was like half a second towards the end but even still that wasn't that's not really pushing yourself anymore like liquid nitrogen is not standard now <laughs> and, and that was the thing where, like, at one point tonight, Linda just said, oh, you know, it's Heston, you've got to push yourself. And what she pushed herself to do was make an ice cream. That's not pushing. Like, that is not pushing. When they listed the ingredients tonight, so you've got bacon, you've got avocado, you've got tea, you've got Vegemite. Mm -hmm. What I missed, I'm missing one. Was the breakfast? And um... tea, avocado. Um, it's really obvious. Someone's going to yell at me. Someone's yelling right now. This is this is what the level was tonight. Um, <laughs> this is what the level was tonight. Cornflakes. That's right. That's cornflakes. Of course. How can how we can forget, forget the cornflakes? Turned, how can I forget? He turned cornflakes into cornflakes. Cornflake milk. No, no, no. Cornflake milk ice cream. Crunchy nut. <laughs> Fucking hell. 
Like, seriously. I did say to a couple of people I was going to avoid screen tonight. Sorry. Um, Sorry. No, no, that's me. It's all me. And trust me, that came out of me because of cornflakes. Um, <laughs> what was really funny was a couple of people, like Michelle on Twitter, who, who sort of interact with all the time, she tweeted out, breakfast into dessert, I got this, and tweeted out two pictures. One, chocolate crackles. And guess what the other one might have been? There might be cornflakes. They might be in a patty pan. And, <laughs> and this is before. Honey joys, are they called? Is that what yep. they're called? Yeah. Yep. And this is before the ingredients were tweeted out. And the ingredients tweeted out. It's like, oh, shit, actually, that would have worked. Just a uh, second later. Now, I'd watched an episode of Bake Off earlier this week where they made a cake with avocado. Avocado is quite good with chocolate in a cake. because yep. it's cool. So you can, you've got to work your ratios out. But that's what it is. I was thoroughly unimpressed with all of the contestants tonight. And I love them. I love the people in that challenge, or most of them. There's one I'm not particularly fond of. You can probably all work that out. I'm not going to say yeah. who it is. But the others, like, I love Deep Into. I absolutely think she's brilliant. But she basically sort of semi-remade um, the Bomb Alaska that she made on, on Sunday. And I had the her... avocado chocolate version. Yeah, basically. That was what she that was what she did. Um, and there again... was no creativity in that. Like. No. Like her one like last night was amazing because she did it with a flavour and a texture that no one would have tried with a bomb Alaska before, which blew their minds. And then all of a sudden it's like they were scared, so they wanted to be safe. I thought the interesting part, by the way, was of all of, all of the boxes, I actually thought that Claire Smith had some of the best stuff. I thought that they gave her, they gave her the worst presentation. But I thought Claire Smith's not actually, she had some of the better ingredients and some of the better things in the challenge for them to use. Now, how they did it, that's open for interpretation. But I thought that Claire Smith gave them a really good array. That was a really good good idea. Um, I thought that Massimo's ideas were good. I I like the mac and cheese, do something with it. And I thought that not enough of them did something with it. Um, I don't know what Tom was thinking. So we have to talk about Tom in the Massimo challenge. Yes. Who makes a mac and cheese milfoire? And more importantly, why? Just why? Like, I love Tom. I love his baking. That was wrong. Like, he shouldn't have done it. I just shouldn't have done it. And the second part of that is how do you lose a bread challenge by not having bread being forward in a bread and butter pudding just putting, I, i'm putting it out there i really like, i agree I logic, really, logic stands to reason i really like dan but the pork was the hero of that dish and i hate using the word hero but it's true yep. and i just, I think Dan should have gone. Um, I really do. I don't think either of them are necessarily brilliant, but I just, I, it, it was a bread challenge and like Katrina made bread and butter pudding. It's pretty bread forward, I think. And do you really want everything to taste like bread? Bread? Um, probably not. Like it, it's going to be flavoured. Bread takes on flavour. There's I mean, so many things you could have done with a bread challenge, but but bread and butter pudding. I mean, technic, but technically, like a honey oat bread is technically just bread which has been flavored. Correct. So, in other words, like if you oh, well, you can taste the honey oat in that bread. Well, that's flavored. Congratulations, you're not tasting the bread anymore. Go home. <laughs> like I just thought that the the parameters of the challenge. It was almost like halfway through they were like, oh, we might need to sort of jig this one a little bit. Um, I think they could have made it, um, they could have changed the parameters and made it tougher, given them some more more um, criteria to meet, I think. Um, and it was also the first episode where I thought the gantry was really irritating. Um, now, also, the other big, the other big thing we sort of need to discuss this week, before we'll get back onto tonight. Yes. The other thing we really need to discuss is the number of people that have already said in the first two weeks of MasterChef, I really want to get into food. And I think that MasterChef is my way of getting into food. 
as opposed to an apprenticeship and maybe some training um and the idea that you bypass maybe the traditional routes of of food training and use master chef as your Keep ahead. i don't understand it well i don't understand how you can go from the one backstory you know and again not naming names but seeing someone cook over the fire you know in wherever they live and then suddenly being like it's a passion of mine i want to see where like food can take me that's great, but you have no vision. You have no idea of what you want to do. You're just like, oh, I like food. Let's do this. But it's like, it was like my favourite, again, my favourite contestant line of the series so far remains that I quit law in order to pursue my tasting boards. And it, it's also a really interesting discussion to be had that during a pandemic, all of these people decided that the food service industry is the way to go. When the food industry was suffering because everything was closed. And all the other, the other part of that too, though, is, is it really the food service industry or is it the celebrity food industry? That's the other question. There are some people in the show who are definitely there because they are interested in food and want to make a difference. Yeah. There are a number of people who seem to be there because they would like to um, have some more likes on Instagram and would definitely like their food blog to take off. Correct. And that is, it's always a bit of a disconnect with, with MasterChef at times when that happens. Um, I find that's, that's the tricky bit. Um, and You find it shows mostly, I, I, from what I've observed anyway, from watching seasons past, I feel like you can clearly see that though in their attitude towards judges feedback yeah. and then also the cooking because like when someone has a clear vision of what their thing is and let's just say even this series I'm it's fusion I'm sticking to yeah. fusion that's what I'm about and like and even if it's just what they're doing for this show and like that's what they're doing for this season like that's what they have committed to they give they have a strong clear idea of what they want to do and they'll probably continue that on if that becomes successful for them. Exactly. And it, it's one of those things where you, you go, look, this is what I, I want to do and I believe in this and I'm going to push this. And mm. look, I'm here to push this and I'm here to learn techniques and I'm here to learn how to be better at this. But this is what I believe and I want to sort of make a go of this versus the adjust and I'm, I'm playing the game, so to speak, and moving through the competition. It's one of the reasons I hate the pins is the pins make it about playing the game rather than making it about can you improve your skills and and be better at what you do now than when you enter the competition and i think that's that's something that a lot of people i think the people who are better at this at, at masterchef in terms of the ones the audience really connect with they connect to people who are clearly there for the for the right reasons i think for example yeah. like oh i'll say straight up i think the people like Deepinder, i think she's amazing um i think you can clearly see her interest in food and i think you that that shows yeah absolutely um, and there's there's a passion and i mean kishwa obviously has his passion for her bangladeshi food and bangladeshi culture and wants to promote that and wants to push that and i, I see that sarah claire in previous seasons with you know the way that she's handled things like you know talking about her fruit and veg and those sorts of she's had a, a goal and a vision and i'm pushing this um you've got to have something about you right um amelia you know a a amelia had desserts and it wasn't just that she can do everything brilliantly but this is where her passion is like laura with pasta last year in in back to win and again we talked about the unfair shit that she copped and definitely unfair shit her passion and her ability is in italian and she is amazing at that and does not do bland she does incredible and Absolutely. people target that. And we've, we've talked, we've talked about that a lot. And like, you know, you, you look at, you look at past winners and you look at people that have gone on to great things and it's because they've got, they've got a vision. They've got something about them. Mm. They're not the people pleasers. They're not the ones who, who do something just because it's what either the public or someone tells them that they should do because they go, Oh, we think you're better. Let's say you're better at desserts then you're savoury and you go, no, no, but my passion is savoury and this is what I do. Yeah. And that's, 
that's the important that's the important point and i think there's i think there are a couple of people who are starting to sort of work out what they're what they're doing in there i mean yeah oh look i've commented on the fact that like brent is annoying me with the way that he does his i'm just a tradie yeah but look at the food brent's actually cooking he's growing so much already Brent is actually showing growth. I mean, I know there's been, uh, you know, look, I'll, I'll say it because Trent, who said when he was eliminated, I've, I've learned so much and I've grown so much. And there wasn't a lot of examples on there. Now, he may, he may have gone home and developed a hell of a lot. But at the time, there was no examples of that. If, if, Grant, if, 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 if Brent was to go tomorrow and say that, I'd go, yeah. No, you have. You have grown already. I can see it in front of me. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see that he's prepared to sort of, you know, he's not changing what he does, but he's learning the techniques. And I think that goes a long way to to sort of making you better at the, better at, at mastership, better at food. Um, and it sets you up for longevity. Like if you're setting yourself up for short term and I'm going to just do this short term, you're not going to be in food that long. It's a long haul um, career. It's not a career that you suddenly decide that you wake up one day and want to do. Like you then have to dedicate your entirety of your life. You may have to give up certain other things, whether that's social time, family time, a lot of other things like that to be really good at this. Um, And you'll notice that a lot of, you know, really, not all of them, but some of them who have dedicated their lives to food, for example, like Claire Smith, they are dedicated to their food and that is their first love yep. for a lot of them. And that's the thing is that, you know, and that's why that's the other reason why I admire to go back to you know Massimo. That's why I admire Massimo so much because food is his passion, but he's managed to come up with a work-life balance where food and his family, and he's just got this beautiful balance about him. And because he's been able to sort of infuse everything together. And that's what I sort of love about, the way he's gone about it and he talks about the fact that the early years were a food slog and he needed to do that and then you get to a point where you're successful enough where you can balance that out you see that with what jamie oliver same thing also with gordon ramsay as well you see they have a balance with their families the kids are cooking with them now he's you know they're introducing their families to food through shows and you know social media and things like that where they're all cooking together you know and it becomes a family journey and not just individual journeys although again for those of you who watch uncle roger if jamie oliver can please stop cooking things like fried rice we'd greatly appreciate it um <laughs> anyway to move on just quickly um i do need to go into the bomb alaska a little bit more Let's do it. so those who watch a lot of bake off are currently recoiling um in horror at the mention of the words bomb alaska um <laughs> it is triggering if you are a Bake Off fan, the first great drama of any form of Bake Off came when in the British Bake Off, one of the one of the bakers took one of the contestants um, ice creams out and left it on the counter and it melted. And so the Bomb Alaska didn't set properly and it all melted away and it wasn't their fault. They, they had put it, done the right thing, but another contestant took it out of the freezer and left it out there. Um, since then, We've seen it a few more times. It never truly sets. Or the other one we've had, and and Christy and I had this, um, we had an amazing one um, at, a, at a food truck um, at the night markets in Sydney, yeah. uh, sorry, miscellaneous city. And while we were there, um, it was really good. But the problem was that it, the centre had frozen solid so much that you just about break your teeth on it and couldn't eat it. Mm. outside was fantastic and the flavors were really nice but because it was sort of had to be snapped frozen it was so solid in the middle that you couldn't eat it um and that became a bit of a problem but every time it's been on bake off and all the versions of bake off and including master chef we've seen it a few times bomb alaskas usually go really badly so the fact that the pinder managed to make one and it worked and the kind of flavors she chose to actually put inside it ladies and gentlemen well done well done i was thrilled like i'm i I love my spice and i know i do need to give a shout out to all of the people who remember who the hell lee harding was because apparently he started appearing on twitter as all these people remember that former idol contestant lee harding sang a song called wasabi and like he's all his emo haircut reappeared and like the album cover reappeared all over twitter i'm like oh that's right that was a thing um 
I have to remember there are people younger than me. Uh, and and so it's all over the place. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a early 2000s flashback for everybody. Um, but the way she did that, like there was never really a doubt. No, nah, absolutely. But she was so confident with her flavours. I mean, I'm not going to lie. We did discuss our yeah. uncertainty about the choices. We were like, this might not go down well and, and someone might choke and need a glass of water from all of the spice. I'm interested. I can't remember who it was, and I apologise to the person, but someone tweeted out tonight for a chef, Jock certainly hates a lot of flavours. He spent a lot of time this week going, I don't really like that. I'm not a fan of that. I don't really like wasabi. I don't really like Earl Grey tea. I don't really like... It's, it's, he doesn't like a lot. It's like Andy. Do you know Andy doesn't like cake? What? I mean, he just spent all of last year of someone made a cake going, I don't eat cake. Followed by going, but that cake's delicious. And I was like, Andy, give it up. You eat cake. So the trick is, is make Andy a cake just to see if he goes, I don't eat cakes. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that to sort of, I thought Claire Smith's night was fine. I thought that she was awkward, unfortunately, because of the way they set her up. Yeah. Little loop. Um, Yotam, I think they wanted to get their money out of Yotam, so that he just sort of walked around a bit. Um, Nigella, I loved the fact that Nigella didn't give a shit. So, like, she walked off and made a cup of tea and came back and just stood there and was like, yeah, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to drink my tea. I don't really care. She'd look fabulous even in holographic form anyway, so whatever. I thought that the use of Massimo was the best use by a mile because you got to watch him cook, you got to see him talk, you got to see him. In his house. And in Medina. No, and at no point did he pretend to be live. Um, no, he's like, come with me. And then his, like, face is right up in the camera and you're like, hi, nurse. <laughs> the other thing that I want to mention before we sort of get towards the end and start wrapping it up, the other thing I want to mention is I really want to mention when they walked in tonight and they supposedly had the Heston stuff set up as he, he took you in and all the... They basically stood there, watched a video on a screen and applauded an animation. <laughs> I don't get the theatric like i like theatrics but i didn't am i missing something you 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 don't mind a bit of blumenthal am i missing something and if i am what am i missing i don't think you're missing anything i think if they didn't present heston blumenthal as something more fantastical than ever before that they wouldn't be doing him justice because that is how he's always been portrayed on MasterChef as this crazy, kooky, out there person. And, I mean, it was a pretty lame attempt. Sorry, guys, it was a very obvious attempt at pretending that it wasn't Heston, but then it is Heston. So I think that, you know, they made it pretty clear from the first the first scene that they showed Um there's no other chef in the world that would ever be introduced by underwater sea turtles and a man had his garden with some crazy mushrooms. Like, hello. I'm like, and the, when they put a fat duck in there, they're like, well, pff, fat duck. Mm. We definitely know who that is now, you know. You know? So, I mean, I think, you know, the smoke behind the, the smoke that was coming out to the left-hand side of the screens was fun. Um, but I think they could have actually just kept the question marks rolling at the beginning and then suddenly appeared his face with a big bang and like some fireworks would have been much better. <laughs> well, speaking of fireworks, I like Pete again. <laughs> Clean cut nap. But who sets fire to the kitchen with paper towels? And secondly, why did nobody react? Like someone just went. No one Mel, ran. Mel went. Is that burning? And then someone said, Is that a fire? And then people on the gantry went, Is that a fire? And they looked down and it's on fire in the microwave. And he went, Oh, the microwave's on fire. Everyone, oh, there's a fire in his microwave. And they walked past going, What's going on? Oh, microwave's on fire. Oh, okay. And everyone's just dawdling around in a circle. Like they're talking about the microwave being on fire. How did no one care? Poor job by the safety team, I might add. Um, but I feel like 
you would think that you would not put pay, pay, the paper towel had absorbed the moisture. Yes. So when it started to heat up, that's what caused it to. Um, so this is the thing. A, don't put, don't put wet paper towel on top of something in the microwave on high. And two, um, if it does, that's cue for you to put a, take it out, put a pan on it or douse it in water. There, there's a tap right nearby if you need it, you know. But it was just the way that everyone casually walked past and went, oh, is the microwave on fire? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah cool. We all kept out. It's all right. We've been through COVID, guys. Fires are nothing. I mean, I mean, at that point in time, I did wonder if someone was going to go grab some um, chicken skewers and come over and put them on there and go, look, we can still cook them. Can still cook them. <laughs> Let's roast some marshmallow, guys. We can do this. We can do this. Look, <laughs> I think just to finish up, personal, and again, I know that you have a, a deep abiding connection to ice cream, but I think that MasterChef needs to put a bit of a pause on ice cream for a bit i think any challenge with dessert ice cream should be banned to make it more challenging yeah i think i think that the ice cream needs to be banned i think they need to come up with more creative ways to do things i just i I don't think they're being creative enough like i said we were talking about elements tonight because you know with heston you see usually a lot of elements so i have to applaud pete for trying to do a dust well done um it's element no one has tried yet but we haven't seen a lot of gels. We've seen, you know, some sauces. We've seen some like creams. We've seen some crumbs, a lot of crumbs, a lot of crumbs. A lot of crumbs, there. too many crumbs. And a lot of like, again, like the cakes torn into little bits again. Um, so I don't think there's been a lot of range of elements. There's not a lot of technique there, um, which is quite apparent in the dessert challenges, especially. Um, and I'm, you know, for anyone who does tend to listen to this podcast, um, from someone who has a very deep knowledge of ice cream um, and in relation to MasterChef, I do. But I'm going to give you one hot tip, which you may not use now since, you know, you might not be in the MasterChef house right this very moment. However, um, please use a cold on glaze, guys. Never, ever try in an hour or anything even an hour and a half to put a warm glaze into a Cuisine Art ice cream machine. They are the best machine on the market, but you, they will only work for you if you give it the correct on glaze. That was the thing. I did notice that. They had all these, like, they'd taken them off the, off the stove shop and going, now we'll put it in the... No. All of them. No, no, no. There was not one person who made a cold on glaze. They no, all made no. warm on glazes. There, is, there are other ways, guys. There are, <laughs> here we go. A little bit, a little bit of schooling on ice cream here, guys. Ice cream, so, ice cream. So, when you would like to infuse your milk mixture with a flavor, a la cornflakes, um, putting them into a pan and heating it up is not the smartest way, because you can also break down whatever that ingredient you're putting into it, and it will actually infuse too much, and it would change the you mean like you mean like soggy cornflakes becoming like porridge it just it it changes the the milk Mm. it it actually can cause it to become more watery to not set properly because you've warmed something up and that you haven't allowed it to cool down so because you don't have that luxury of time if you if you've got all day make a warm on glaze strain it let it cool down put it in the ice cream machine when you're ready but when you're in a you're in a time situation, cold on glaze is your best friend. You can do the same thing in a food processor yep. by putting an ingredient in. I did this tonight. I put finger lime skins into my milk and I blitzed it to hell. And it warms up a little bit, ever so ever so slightly. It's still cold milk, but it's just warmed up just a bit from the whirring so that it infuses the milk enough with the taste or the essence or the texture of whatever you're wanting to put into that to then go into your cold on glaze and set perfectly and you will have the best ice cream every time. So go tips. There we go. These are are seasoned, seasoned tips, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to make an ice cream and therefore enter every season of MasterChef from here until the end of time, because surely that's the only dish you need to know how to make is an ice cream. Correct. Um, 
I, I really hope they ban them. I mean, I know it was a great description of what to do, but I'm really... I don't want to see any more ice cream for the next three weeks. No, I'm if really... I do, I'm going to cry. We'll probably prepare, get the tissues out because, you know, Reynolds. Can we add that to the drinking game? We'll be really drunk then if we add oh, ice cream to Reynolds the drinking game. Speaking of that, <laughs> speaking of that, just to finish off, I put a poll up. So I probably should give the results of the poll. So I put mm-hmm. a poll up because, you know, some of the people who listen to this are aware of the unpleasantness last year that happened when I tweeted things that were not necessarily pro rental and uh, um, maybe calling that some of the things that he made were off his own menu and then they went back and deleted things off the menu and went, no, they weren't, and all hell broke loose. And I got several hundred really nasty, malicious tweets because I dared to question something. Um, I asked, because Reynolds is back on Sunday night, do I limit the tweeting or brave the Reynolds stands? And I do want to say that with a resounding 95% of the vote, I will be tweeting as per normal on Sunday and braving the Reynolds stands. So Thank God. I will be preparing um, for Doom because I have no doubt that that will be coming my way. Um, I, I, I... Again, I'm fair. If he does something cool, great. If he does something that annoys me, same thing. If he does something that I think is a bit, you know, three elements, I want to see something different than what he normally puts on a plate. That'd be really good because he is creative. We've always said that. I just want to see him do something a little bit different to the several elements that he always does. If I see a moose, if I see a soil. Yeah, exactly. If I see, I'm going to cry. That's going to be my tears. So that'll be already in ahead of us for Sunday. Thank you, Alicia, for doing this. It's been absolutely fantastic to finally get you on. We've been trying thank for you a while. so much. It was a joy to be on with you. And thank you for so, so <laughs> we got you on in a week where there were lots of ice creams. <laughs> and Heston, you know, I, I was excited about that. That was funny. Heston and ice cream. So, and ice cream. So thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for the feedback, by the way, on week one. This is a very different experience for me flying minus christy um and so i really appreciate all the feedback which has been really good um and so i've been chris and i will catch you all later